Okay, everyone, uh, welcome to another edition of the Perception and Action Journal Club. Today, I'm joined by a nice full room of five, five other people. And our focus today is going to be on the issue of focus of attention and cueing uh, as it pertains in particular to physical therapy and injury rehabilitation for athletes. So we're going to get into that topic. We're going to look at briefly at a very recent study in this area, and then we're going to springboard it into kind of broader issues. You know, I think this is a really important topic uh, where we could make a lot of gains um, in this area. So before that, I want to go around the room and let everybody introduce themselves because there's some new people you, you may not know. Uh, we'll start my, next to me and on my screen is Jed. I'll let you introduce yourself. All right. Thank you, Rob, for the introduction, um, as well as the opportunity to speak with everyone, all these experts in the field. Mm -hmm. Uh, my background, um, I did a PhD in motor learning at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, um, particularly looking at um, training effects of attentional focus with respect to balance control. Um, as part of that research, I got very interested in the underlying neural mechanisms or basically why is this concept of external focus effective and started getting into fMRI and looking at brain mechanisms underlying um, behavioral adaptations. Um, now, I currently am a postdoc. I've transitioned a little bit to looking at the neuroplasticity, looking under underlying ACL injury prevention um, and ACL injury rehabilitation. So I use a lot of um, real-time biofeedback um, in conjunction with fMRI, EEG, those kind of techniques to ultimately develop ways to improve uh, retention and transfer of motor skills at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Wow, cool. That's mm -hmm. really interesting. Uh, Nick, going across the top. Yeah. So Nick Winkleman, I'm the head of athletic performance for Irish rugby. So I work with our professional and our national teams. Uh, by trade, I'm a strength conditioning coach for the last 15 years. And like uh, many of the individuals on this call, of which the vast majority are, are heroes of mine in the motor learning <laughs> space, I have an interest in, in coaching and communication and motor learning. So I got a PhD looking at the intersection of basically attentional focus and sprinting. And yeah, it's my it's my pet project. It's the thing that wakes me up in the morning and keeps me up at night. Cool. In the bottom right, uh, Ali. Hi, my name is Ali Gokler. My background is uh, sports physiotherapy. And every time I run into problems with patients, uh, I always ask myself the question like, hi, hi, how, why, and what, why is it not going the way as I, I was expecting? And that got me into research and this was like initially as it started as a hobby and it got a little bit out of control and it ended up in a phd <laughs> uh but anyway I, I i fell in love with research but i always wanted that connection with uh, the clinical field um, so currently i'm doing my postdoc at the university of uh, paderborn at the exercise science and neuroscience unit and we are primarily looking at motor learning but also the behavioral and neural underpinnings, linking those aspects together in uh, both in the fundamental research approach, but also in a translational research approach. That's sometimes that I feel is a little bit missing in our motor learning domain. How can we bring it to the field uh, to take it away from the lab to the field? Um, so uh, thanks for having me and I hope I can contribute. Oh, you're welcome, very welcome. And the former uh, podcast guest, uh, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> <True>. <laughs> um, hi, I'm uh, Anna Benjamins. Uh, my uh, background is also in physical therapy, my bachelor's. Uh, then with my master's, I went on to, to sports medicine. I got my PhD in uh, human movement science. Um, currently, I'm a postdoc researcher uh, here in Groningen in the Netherlands at the Department of Human Movement Science and uh, uh, focusing on motor learning studies uh, in, in youth female soccer girls um, investigating the effects on different types of motor learning mm -hmm. and how they move uh, or transfer to the field so the, the focus is uh, really also yeah. to to uh, to have the transfer investigated also so I work on a daily basis with the youth athletes and trainers and coaches trying to help them uh, implement motor learning in their daily practice, but they also give me uh, great input uh, and, and give me uh, good questions that um, that we can work on. Great. Uh, and last but not least, Harjeev. Yeah, hey guys. Um, pleasure to be here. My name is Harjeev. Uh, I'm currently a second year PhD student at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, uh, under Dr. Gabby Wolf. 
Uh, my background, actually, it started off with an ACL tear that got me into motor learning. Um, I was just interested in how PTs were telling me what to do, and I would do it. So that whole aspect got me into uh, motor learning. Got my master's uh, in motor learning, and then uh, took a couple years off, was in England for some time, and then came here. Um, and I'm really interested in how these characteristics of instruction and feedback can actually you know, make a uh, severe impact in, uh, in optimizing motor learning. <laughs> Great. We get, we've got a nice interdisciplinary uh, group here, <laughs> lots of different backgrounds and, and personal experience with ACL. <laughs> um, so I'm going to put on the, the, so the paper I said it, we wanted to quickly look at, I don't think we'll spend too much time on it because it, I don't think there's a, too much to it really. Um, <laughs> Is but I think it covers the. I picked it because it's very recent and it covers kind of the general issues. Is is this one uh, comparing the effects of external focus of attention on con and a continuous control task, cognitive task on postural control and ACL reconstruction athletes? And I thought what I would do is I'll I'll try to give my my brief summary of what they found and maybe then just go around the room and and see get your kind of general finding thoughts about it and anything you picked up or want to talk about it we can really take it anywhere. So so what this you know the point of of this paper and I think one we're going to focus on a lot today is that an issue with uh, recovering athletes is is this internal focus of attention. Uh, on, uh, in particular, in this example, of controlling posture, um, both because of their injury and maybe because of the, contributed to the way by the way we do physical therapy. Um, but what you see often is you get increased. If, you, for example, if you let them stand on one foot, make them stand on one foot, you get this increased sway in ACL recovery patients, which can be potentially uh, dangerous because it could lead to re-injury. So the idea is to try to get them away from doing kind of internal focus, kind of conscious control of posture by adding some task uh, to, to get the, their, their attention away from their, their body. So in this study, what they did was have the person stand on one leg on a, a wobbly, wobbly board. Um, they had both ACL recovery patients and non-injured control group. And they compared three things. They compared uh, an external focus of attention condition in which the paper people were told to minimize the movement of the markers on the board, um, which is very analogous to, you know, a classic experiment by Gabby at World Fund Colleagues, right, or balance studies. Um, then uh, they had, uh, the second test was what they called a cog continuous cognitive control. Basically, it was doing math in your head. So while you were balancing, they gave you number. I can't remember what exactly what it was, but it reminded me of the one I've used before is where you have to count backwards by three. Mm -hmm. <laughs> something yep. like that mm -hmm. right so it's yeah. it's a distracting thing gets yes. so you can't think about balance is the idea and then they had a no instruction control uh group and basically they found i'll put up the slide pattern the results there's a bunch of different results but the main one that i think they want to sell is the, the one here um for sway um, when you measure people sway on the on the board the cognitive continuous number counting a uh, math in your head task reduced sway relative to the control which was no instructions and relative to the external focus of instructions and the control and the external were not different from each other um, this was only true for the acl patients for healthy patients there was no difference in any of the conditions for sway there were some other findings but that's the main one i think and from this i think they want to argue and suggest that this kind of dual task, this cognitive control task may be useful in therapy for helping people. They focus a lot on automization of posture. So getting yourself out of, the, out of focusing on your own body and letting your posture be controlled automatically. So I think that's, that's kind of what I took out of it. Um, obviously, there's some th things we can poke out of it. And, and um, so maybe we'll go around the room and, you know, your thoughts or the, any, anything you want to focus on. So let's go, if we go in the re reverse order, Harjeev, if there's any I know I saw you post one comment on Twitter that jumped out at me right away about this paper. Uh, yeah, well, I think the paper was good in the sense that it kind of, you know, taking more of the um, literature and applying it to the clinical sort of ECL population. I think that's very much needed. Um, and uh, I think maybe they could have potentially added a uh, internal focus group uh, to actually 
you know compare the effects because i know some uh, most most studies also show that control and internal focus are relatively the same but i think it would be nice to kind of see the actual um, you know having a group that did if um, but i do agree with the whole dual task thing um, i think that's where the um, sort of studies should be shifting now um, to more dual task interventions because i think that is um, sort of appropriate in terms of representing rehab um, and return to play but um, yeah i mean i think other than that i think the it was it was pretty spot on in terms of what they did um i i enjoyed reading it for sure mm -hmm. uh anna um yeah i i enjoyed reading it also um i i agree with uh with harjeev what he said in uh potentially they could have added a, a purely internal focus group um what i think is really important though to measure really motor learning is uh retention and uh, i think one important aspect uh, method wise in this study is that um to really see the the, the eventual results is uh, that they should have added a retention test i think that's that's an important uh, aspect to uh, to say mm -hmm. ali yeah. yeah, so luckily I had a couple of alternatives, uh, so <laughs> I, I, I come down to my number three. Uh, so, um, no, I, I, I like the design and I agree with Harty if I think uh, uh, adding a, a cognitive task uh, helps us to understand uh, attentional resources that athletes have. Um, not only in the acute phase where typically those kind of exercises are done, but also incorporated later on in some more complex uh, motor tasks. Um, the thing uh, that I had a question about was the reason why they put the patients in a fully extended knee. Uh, this is something uh, that leads to a certain, certain degree of freedom. And I was also wondering yeah. if uh, adding the cognitive pack did not result actually in the freezing of the uh, of the degrees of freedom, and subsequently that may be seen uh, as a reduced area of sway. Uh, and here I always have the question: What's the optimum of, of mm -hmm. sway? Uh, how much adaptability do you need in your system? Mm -hmm. Because very stable does not mean you're very uh, adaptable to changing conditions. Mm -hmm. Nick, what do you? Yeah. Yeah, Good points, yeah. I think some, some, some great points. I really like the one on sway, especially as someone who works with, with, with athletes primarily, that ability to adapt to a, an ever-changing environment is essential. So, Ali, really good point. Um, just a couple of things. The, the first thing is when we noticed that there was no difference across the healthy population, that didn't seem overly surprising. If you look at a couple of Gabby's early papers, uh, notably the one on the acrobats, we know that the impact of attentional focus interacts with the difficulty of the task. And so in terms of the difficulty of the task for the, the healthy population, even had we added an internal focus, unless it was something hyper constraining like focus on knee motion or something to that effect, we might not have seen a difference there as well. So that was kind of point one. Uh, the second point, and this is pedantic, but it's something that stood out to me is Technically, they, they put a phone in the balance board that had kind of a level, and then they projected that level onto the screen. If you look at latency effects on phones compared to yeah. react, visual reaction time, I actually believe that, you know, for me to, to trust that finding, I need to know if they controlled for latency period. I, I believe there's a strong uh, argument that there could have actually been what they were seeing on the screen was a delay from what actually was happening on the board, which would completely explain why the external didn't work as well as the, as the continuous cognitive task. So those were two additional things I thought of in reading. I'm reacting here. Mm -hmm. Great yeah, good point. points. Yeah, Jed? Uh, these are all excellent points. I'm bringing up the rear here. Most of these have already been addressed. Um, <laughs> Nick's, Nick's last one is actually the first one on my little sticky notes here. Um, the potential delay, um, almost any type of real time or even Arguments for real-time biofeedback systems aren't usually in real time. There's usually some, some sort of short delay. So in this case, there um, very plausibly could be a delay. Um, similarly, um, in defense of the potential null effects for an external focus, um, whether or not these are the right outcome measures to be looking at, um, 
these are all, these are all linear metrics of pastoral sway. Um, there's some emergent research that more adaptive measures um, that are more prone to detecting, say, alterations in dynamic environments, say, a sample entropy of a displacement or velocity time series, or some sort of nonlinear metric may have um, picked out differences. Um, likewise, these are only these are effectively looking at the balance board velocity and characteristics itself, um, not so much any sort of kinematics of the kinetic chain. So it's possible that uh, we may have not seen changes there at the base um, or any changes in the balance board, but something could have um, occurred higher up or say in knee kinematics, which is particularly relevant to ACLR. Um, but then, uh, yep. potentially, oh, go on, somebody's gonna interject. No, nope. nope. oh, sorry. Um, so then <laughs> another uh, potential um, argument in, I shouldn't say an argument, another thing I'd, be, I'd like to discuss is that um, alternatively, instead of in defense of an external focus, is it also possible an external focus may just not have been as effective for this population? Um, for instance, in Parkinson's disease, there's some research that you need an intact central nervous system for an external focus to be effective. Um, some of the work by Quincy Alme um, Almeida, who the last name is, is showing that for those that have a um, central nervous system that isn't functioning properly, you need to um, elicit an internal focus to be effective. And I think that could be a way to springboard into the next part of this discussion um, in which situations or when this external focus could be effective. But I think the paper itself, I love the idea of a dual task or some sort of um, additional more real world scenario, I think really um, adds a great contribution to the literature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think those are great points. So you, you, as you were saying, Jeff, they took most of my. But when I when I read the any paper like this, and you don't you don't find an effect of external focus of attention over something else, my immediate alarm bells go off. Right, it's one of the most replicated findings in motor learning. Not that it means it's wrong, but it, you should be digging deeper. Um, I, I I like I really um, the great points about all of them. Uh, the the no instruction control con condition and, and focus of attention experiments is always dodgy, right? Because you don't know what the people are doing. Mm -hmm. um, so it's always a challenge. It's really difficult if that's your only comparison. And I really, I agree yes. with Ali's point, I um, really got to me. Um, I, I would have liked to see more analysis of the functionality of the movement, right? They mentioned, like you said, with freezing, they mentioned that actually reduction of sway can be the form of stiffening right mm -hmm. they mentioned which is not functional at all yep. right it's not mm -hmm. helpful and so for that related to that i also like i always think external focus of attention cues have two two things they benefit from one is they pull you away so you can't disrupt automaticity or, or you're in control but but they also at the same time can direct you to useful information to control your so it's not just so the dual task is just distracting you right Whereas I think a really well-designed external focus of attention cue can do both distract you, you. and lead you to more useful things. And um, so I, you know, I think there could be uh, benefits from there. So I don't know, um, your, Jed, your point about, I don't know if we want to start there, you know, when, or if we want, before we came on the air, we were talking about, you know, the, the general issue of um, the problem of internal, using internal cues in, in physical therapy. Um, I don't know if we, in, in rehab, I don't know if we want to start there or um, anyone want to have someone where they want to take this? Well, I can start it because yeah. I'm particularly yeah. interested in those that yeah. have, especially Nick with a lot of coaching experience yeah. and far more clinical experience and Anna and Ali um, relative mm -hmm. to myself. Um, mm -hmm. I think what's interesting, we talked about it before we went live, is that this, as you noted, Rob, in the scientific literature, the external focus is one of the most widely replicated findings out there, um, myself included. and. Mm -hmm. 25 plus years of this research, you think this would be a common um, utilized technique in coaching and physical therapy. Um, you think ESPN, every time somebody shoots a free <laughs> therapy, someone would say, use an external focus. You think, would, you think it would be at least somewhat common. Um, mm -hmm. So what I, what I with the Motor Learning Institute that Ali and Adam do and in this new book by Nick, I think it's a huge and excellent idea to start transitioning um, what we see in the lab into what we can call the real world. And I guess my question is, is how well do we think all of these lab findings are going to translate to the real world and what kind of generalizations we should make from these lab findings and what you guys have seen anecdotally and with your own um, line of research? Yeah. Um, yeah, I was, and I, I was building on that too. I, you know, uh, we've, I think there's been a fair amount of work done on the coaching side of things and, you know, Nick's done a lot, but I think physical therapy poses some of its own unique challenges, mm -hmm. right? And in, in, in getting people to use extra, you walk, I'm walking in saying that I have a problem with my knee, mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. and you're asking the the, the physician yeah, not right. to use the word knee. Yeah. I know that's oversimplified, but mm-hmm. um, Nick, kind of, what what are your thoughts on kind of this this issue of you know, eternal cueing and physical therapy? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I, I think it go. There, there's many different ways to look at this, but if we go right back to the beginning of of the education of physical therapists as well as strength conditioning coaches. We just said it before we got on the call that you know, motor learning in, in some programs most certainly might dominate the curriculum, but in many, and I don't think I'm understanding this, it's a footnote. It might be one module within a course. It might be one course within an overall for your curriculum. Uh, by no means does it sit as a parallel track uh, against all of the, let's say, hard skills. And what I mean by hard skills is in strength conditioning, that might be program design, exercise selection, physiology, biomechanics, anatomy, this this visible, highly tangible curriculum that's part of what we do, where the coaching is a bit more invisible. It's the soft skill, many people call it, but equally, it's how we translate that what into the real world, yet it doesn't get nearly the amount of airtime in academic and coaching curriculums. And so I think we're at a point now where on the professional education side, so the work of, of Ali and Ann and myself and others, you know, and Harjeev and, and Jed, what you guys do on social media as well, we're trying to put that information out there. But ultimately, it's going to have to be the, the academic institutions and the coach education curricula that actually start to bring this in and as i say elevate how we teach to the same level as what we teach because this is a gap yeah. <laughs> in the movement profession mm-hmm. yeah yeah perhaps if i can add to this discussion mm-hmm. uh, i feel that um this discussion around internal and external focus is, is a little bit polarized at some times mm-hmm. uh, the opponents and the, and the supporters uh, and each uh, each camp will find their own uh, arguments to build a case, uh, just like you do in court. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I think you can always find find evidence uh, to substantiate mm-hmm. what you're trying to tr- to bring across. But what I think is important to ask ourselves is: um, Do we need to delineate the information we provide an athlete or a patient as to what the goal of the exercise is? And then I think the second point that is relevant is what kind of instructions do you give during practice? And I think those are slightly different areas in their learning phase. Uh, and I, I discussed this with uh, with Gabi Wolf because I got so many questions from the, the uh, from students like, uh, so Ali, when we do an internal focus, are we doing it wrong? Uh, no, I would say no, you don't do it wrong. But I think there is a there is this delineation of where you provide some information about what the goal of a certain exercise is and then you have a choice and i think uh, i usually present it graphically i said you have two flavors you can stay on the explicit and internal focus or now and this is where it becomes difficult because you have to change habits now now you also have the flavor of using external focus instructions for your practice because afterwards and this is what gabby wolf also pointed out in her paper in uh, 2016, she pointed out perfectly by saying (laughs) an external focus does not mean that your athlete is not aware of what he or she is doing. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's where some of the misconceptions I think uh, have taken place and where we probably speak in a different level of what we actually mean. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Uh, Harjeev, what about, you know, you you've looked at a lot of this literature and obviously you work with Gabby um, and maybe this relates to Jed's point about is this, you think, you think this really is a universal rule uh, the external focus or are there possibly exceptions and situations? Maybe that's the wrong way. Maybe the (laughs) alleys put it better. You know, there's not exceptions. There's just different ways. We're talking about different things. I think think that the, the, the crux of the problem is actually just understanding what, external versus internal versus attention in general even is um are we talking about execution versus preparation uh, this is like a couple of things that we have to really take into account especially as, as as clinicians and coaches um also you know 
are we i mean there's there's a lot i think for, to answer your question though um i think there's room for for internal when it's not execution um mm -hmm. execution that's when you go more external um you know i gave a talk at a uh, volleyball conference and you know i got the same questions as we usually do you know uh when when do we give i mean you can give internal cues when you're not actually performing right i can tell you what to fix um and stuff like that but <laughs> once once you're on like the court receiving a ball for example you got to be in that sort of external uh realm of things and second um to to ollie's point i think there's many internals or external cues that coaches have to really work with i mean it's not just a one uh, a one cue fits all situation. exactly exactly yeah. Yeah. There's, there's multiple different external cues that you have to work with um and the, the issue then becomes is one doesn't work therefore we don't believe in the literature anymore so that's where like the, the, the issue is um but uh, yeah i mean i think i think there's room for for internal but not but it's not what the definition of you know the work that the work that um, stems upon it um you know it's it, 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 that's the problem is that we don't know what it is um okay. which okay. kind of resonates through everything else so once that's clear i think i think it'll be i think it'll make its way to espn for sure <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, i i agree uh, i i think there could be a lot more subtlety and, and, and clarity in the definitions of a lot i think like particularly people i think like keith loesch and colleagues yeah. have done a great job in this and looking exactly when are you talking about focusing uh, and, and so i think i think that's kind of research helps as well any other thoughts on those this yeah. kind of jet jet yeah if you don't mind me following up i think harji's points are mm -hmm. great and i kind of wanted to jump in with everyone i know when i uh, i first he introduced with nick it probably seemed like i was on a camp against uh nick's book or not necessarily mm -hmm. in supportive but i think what's important for all of us as we start moving forward is to not necessarily make this about camps or a side where we're picking we're finding evidence to support an internal or support an external we just go where the data shows us and right. um, if we do this we're going to find that in certain instances what harjeev is saying maybe in a specific population in this case maybe an internal might be helpful if it's not during execution or whatever the case is but as we're all have backgrounds in this field um, these nuances i think make it difficult to just implement into a physical therapy set setting so do you just tell every physical therapist um, use an external focus all the time this will work you're good to go and i think my guess is nick's book probably helped and you can probably elaborate on this um, how do we actually get this these nuances into physical therapy so we're using it effectively and not just trying to overgeneralize um, findings from say a large review where there's specific cases where it may not be as effective right yeah yeah so you know I've, I've been a sports physiotherapist for what 28 years or so now and uh, I can tell you from clinical perspective mm -hmm. if if I would spend uh, an hour an hour and a half with my ACL patient and I would only use my one liner just like mm -hmm. Archie said <laughs> with an external focus it's not working. Yep. So exactly. I, I, th I think we also need to take that that science known findings from how certain external focus instructions have been given in experiments, but to translate that to the clinical situation. And those are different. And, and Nick, perhaps you can say something about that, how it is in coaching. It's a different context and it requires a different approach. Yeah. yeah sure. Nick, you want to yeah. jump in uh, there? Yeah, I think. Yeah. For sure. So I think um, there, there's a couple really nice points in there. Ali, if I can start with, with your point. Um, I, I first presented uh, on attentional focus, I, I don't know when it was, 2008, 2009. And for probably a good five, six years, I presented the literature in what I felt was a pure authentic way, which is overwhelming in favor mm -hmm. of, of external. Mm -hmm. Um, I do believe when we're dealing with a healthy nervous system, an external focus of attention, Harjeev, to your point, during execution is a principle of motor yeah. learning, and I'm going to need a lot of evidence to move me off that, and I think it's grounded in science, so let me start there. Um, yeah. how, however, to, to Ali's point, I was getting all the questions. Well, Nick, yeah. are you saying we can never talk about the body? And even as I reflected, I'm like, well, hold on, I still talk about the body, Mm -hmm. But, and, and Anna, you, you referred to it. It has to do with time. Mm -hmm. It's a temporal feature. 
And, and I've been putting up a graphic. It's probably one of the main ones from the book, not to promote the book, but I came to the same conclusion where there's this difference between a description of a movement and the cue of a movement. Yeah. And when I'm describing a movement, I'm trying to portray knowledge. And that, hey, I want you to understand what you're about to go through. I want to build self-efficacy, confidence. I want to lower perceived anxiety of what you're about to go in. So I'm building up knowledge structures, mental representation of the concept of the movement. But that's very different than the implicit representation of how to perform it. And so for me, I always talk about that the, the cue is the last idea that goes in their head before they move. Ultimately, the cue is the focus yeah, we but, want them to yeah. adopt. Yeah. And so for me, the cue needs to be either an external or some analogy uh, invoking a, 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 an image in the mind. Yeah. And so what I like about that approach is one, you know, Jed, to, to answer your question on my lived experience, mm -hmm. that echoes over 15 years of strength and conditioning. And that I get the best of both worlds, but it's a temporal parameter. And that I give you the information about what I'm going to ask you to do. That's what. But then if I say you need to extend your hip fast, slow, I just don't know. I still need to give you some kind of indication of how to pull it together into right. the environment. And right. that's where external focus of attention and analogy comes in. Uh, the final point, point I'd like to make is obviously, and I said this on Twitter the other day, Jed, to your very point, not all studies have been done. I'm mm -hmm. most certain that there are nuanced arenas. And absolutely, if we are dealing with people with compromised motor systems who do not have certain neural circuitry working, then that, from a context perspective, shifts us into a, a domain, to your very point, where an internal focus versus an external focus might come back uh, into play. But I think if we look at Beck's work and a lot in the Parkinson's and stroke area, there, there is a lot of mixed findings on both sides of the fence. And it comes right. back to Ali's ultimate point and, and Harjeev's point. It's not always internal, external. It's about the right external. And many studies use very poor language that has, in my yes. opinion, suffers mm -hmm. ecological validity, meaning PTs and strength coaches would never use the cue. Mm -hmm. And for me, yeah. that's the defense of why it didn't work, not because internal was better. Yeah, mm -hmm. very good point, Nick. I totally agree. Yeah. yeah, and and maybe I can add something. What I was also missing in the in the study we're talking about is 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 also the general instruction, telling the patients, okay, this is what you need to do, like like Ali is saying, and that that can have some some internal cueing maybe also. But then indeed, when practicing, okay, and then you have you have choices, but but they need to know the, the the purpose of the exercise. And when you're only talking about analogies and they just don't get what you want from them, exactly. it's 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 kind of hard. Um, we have uh, done some uh, practicals with a student a couple of uh, weeks ago, and we wanted them to land softly. Uh, we used an analogy, uh, well known, I guess, okay, pretend you're landing on X. He was looking at us, he tried, he just couldn't do it. And he was like, what are you talking about X? So we we're here in a, in a fitness room and I, he just couldn't do it. And then uh, we changed, okay, your sound now on a scale from one to 10 is, is, is about six, seven. Please try to reduce your sounds till like two or three. Oh, yeah. And then oh, all yeah. of a sudden it was like this and he was able to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we, and in the We studies, videotaped that, yeah. Yeah, it was yeah, really yeah. fun yeah. and amazing to, to experience that because in studies, it's, it's exactly, it's one sentence versus the other sentence versus the other sentence. And like Nick is saying, while coaching or while, uh, you know, rehabbing, uh, it's also the, the variety, what, what works and what doesn't work with one patient, but also uh, during one half hour of rehab, you just cannot work with the same sentence all over again. Well, and that's why Harjeev, I, I think the work, Harjeev, that you're doing, and you and I share a passion for linguistics, I spent more time studying linguistics when I wrote my book than anything else, because yeah. if you yeah. once you understand the structure of human language and verb use specifically, you start to realize that my push is your drive, is your punch. Yeah. And as long as we become aware of that as clinicians and strength coaches, we can take the meaning of our cue, which might be spot on, and give it a new coat of paint to help that person understand. Because ultimately, it's usually not a failure of meaning. It's a failure of interpretation. And unfortunately, that comes through the lens of language if we're talking about instructions. Yeah, 
whenever I teach a course on motor learning, I always kick it off with a, a sentence. And it's a very generic sentence. Mm -hmm. And I just ask the students to count the number of the letter Fs they see. Oh, and, yes. yeah. and, and I only yeah. give them like like five seconds and then uh, I ask them to uh, raise your hand who's, who's seen uh, one, two. And typically they start raising their hand with three and the, actual, the right answer was six. But my point is uh, my instruction or my question actually may not have been clear to all the students. So they may have given just the right answer because there's some social pressure, but also from a motor learning perspective, Maybe if I would give them, uh, some students uh, 15 seconds time, they would have given the right answer. And that's yeah. sometimes going back to physical therapy, where I'm from. What I see a lot of times is that they mistake actual performance and don't look at the long-term effects that we would usually measure with, uh, with retention in, in, in effect when do actual uh, learning effects take place. And they typically are a little bit too impatient to, to let motor learning take place. So what happens, okay, I'm giving my external focus instructions because I've read something about it and I've been working now on it uh, for a week or two weeks uh, and it doesn't work. Patient doesn't improve. Uh, <laughs> give it going, some time. <laughs> give it some time and also yeah. consider, consider your language because that's exact, I totally agree with you guys. The linguistics is very important. Yeah, I've had a, a similar experience to you, Nick, and talking with coaches and things, you know, you present them this, these findings and how overwhelming it is. And sometimes you get skepticism about research in, in, in the sure. practice, applied side. I know those experiments are over controlled and fake. Um, my point I always make is even if you don't believe me, <laughs> this body of research, the coaching and physical therapy have been so biased towards internal cueing why not just open up your toolkit and at least try this different thing of external cue? All it can do is it's add free. to your tools. Yeah. Even if you don't believe it's better, which you should, <laughs> but, but, um, you know, at least try and try changing, you know, uh, turn your hips to the ball to turn your belt to the ball and see what mm -hmm. happens. <laughs> you can't hurt, right? So, um, yeah. So I think those are some good points there. Jed, I'd like to ask you about Parkinson's and, mm -hmm. and your, your, some of your points around the benefit of internal and, I've been, I've been, I, I find it to be a, a critically important area and I have a passion for working in Parkinson's in, in the future. And because obviously it's a, it, it's a disease state that can be debilitating. And I think motor learning and obviously the use of, of dopaminergic drugs can be helpful. But when you talk about paradoxical Parkinson's and in all the, all the cases that I've come in contact with seem to be, it's, it's the automaticity of movement movement. It's organizing the movement. If it's Michael J. Fox in terms of skating the ice uh -huh. or the bicycle or the stairs uh -huh. or the differentiation on the ground with the lines, how do we rectify that with some of the findings possibly suggesting internal focus? And I'm thinking back to your earlier point to bring it into daily life. Mm -hmm. um, so I specifically don't do Parkinson's. Um, I'm more interested in ACL reconstruction. I think Parkinson's though is a very unique population to look at this, um, particularly as I know all of you have probably read Gabby's uh, optimal theory of motor learning, where the general um, the purely theoretical component at this point is that there's a stopaminergic um, boost um, when using, say, motivational princes, principles or even shifting your attention. Um, however, the problem with Parkinson's is that dopamine is typically produced near the brain stem and the basal ganglia. And if that area is disrupted or can't do this, um, providing that boost won't, may, may not work. And again, I'm not saying it won't work, but it may not work as well. So that's why, at least in these studies, they show that if you provide somebody with dopamine um, uh, medication that can restore the central nervous system component, then when you provide the external focus, it becomes beneficial because it can gauge those systems. Um, what really all that means, um, at least to me, is that more research is needed, uh, particularly as we translate into this real world. Um, some of the areas where external focus hasn't been replicating as well, which could be to your point, might not be the best cues, whatever the case is, say even like gait or continuous tasks or in older adults, um, sometimes these are um, populations where that central nervous system might not be functioning as well, so they cannot engage that um, sensory motor system or wherever they need to apply that. Um, so ways to kind of get back to your question, um, is to start doing research studies that better replicate the real world. And I think that would help a lot of coaches and translate that. Um, a simple example is say, 
For ACL reconstruction, you might do the drop vertical jump. So jump off a box, jump up, and you can look at your knee biomechanics. Um, plenty of people have shown just putting someone in virtual reality while they're doing this, so say a moving ball or defender, whatever the case is, your knee biomechanics are drastically different than if you're jumping without that, um, that virtual reality. So when you make the real world into play or put in those perceptual cognitive demands, it changes your biomechanics. But the research studies are typically done before that level of nuance. So I think yeah. um, doing studies that could easily show an external focus is very beneficial, which of course is the side I'm, side I'm generally on, um, but just to try to find ways to bring that real world into the lab or find some middle ground to better understand that. Mm -hmm. If I can just ask there, Jed, do you, as, as you look over the overall literature, do you feel it is skewed towards to lab and, and lacking, let's say, ecological validity in, yep. in your experience? Yeah, I mean, I know there's no easy way. I mean, like I said, I've done this uh, myself as well. It's not, there's no uh, easy way to bring, say, the real world into the lab. Um, but that's why I think a lot of the move towards virtual reality, augmented reality, um, you know, say the Microsoft HoloLens, um, technologies that can um, simulate the real world a little bit better, I think would be a big component. Um, and I think that would help um, at least coaches and practitioners translate this, because basically to your point, or I think Ali might have said it is, I can't just give them an external focus cue the whole time. Like we're talking and there's people walking around and there's music in the background. Like it doesn't, the world doesn't work like that. So they have a tough time bringing these dart throwing studies say to the real world. And I think yeah, all yeah. it requires from us is doing more research and um, better clarifying all this. Yeah, I, I totally agree, Jed. That, that's one of the reasons why we uh, finished our, uh, just uh, recently a, a pilot study. And the whole idea behind this is that we want to translate our fundamental research finding now to the clinical situation. So in, in short, what we've done is we've written a six week balance training program or postural stability training program for ACL patients uh, containing uh, three sessions a week and uh, including all the instructions, but the exercise programs were different from day to day so in order to represent ecological valid conditions and also introducing variable practice, of course. But we wanted to have a program that typically reflects what happens in the daily clinic. Because if I give my patient three exercises for six weeks in the same order, you know, it's not only the, the language as a confounder, but also the, the practice uh, uh, organization itself. So, uh, so we have some preliminary results and they look quite promising uh, where we randomize them between external and in internal. So they did exactly the same exercises but the difference were the instructions, uh, but I'll keep you posted once yeah. we've- uh, well, I'm, I'm excited data. to see it. I mean, I would still, yeah. of course, vote for an external focus. It's just more of a looking for more research like that. And I think to your point, I know, um, and you've done some of this as well, um, longer training studies, I also think are particularly important, especially if we're talking with ACL reconstruction, as we know, it's a nine to 12 month recovery and we're extrapolating findings from, you know, 40 trials of balancing on a wobble board at a 24 hour retention. As yeah. anyone knows that does, um, neuromuscular training or any sort of long rehabilitation. Yeah. This is weeks. And of course, it's easy to say, let's do a 10 week potential focus study. It's a lot more complicated than that. And yeah, again, yeah. It, it's very possible. And I would believe that an external focus would be beneficial, but uh, this could help that whether it's clinical trials or something that's longer or exactly what Ali said, where we're um, replicating a more realistic paradigm and then doing that manipulation, um, I think would help and help alleviate PTs and coaches concerns and whether this would transfer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think just a, a couple things. I have my EndNote pulled up, and, and I don't want to speak from a clinical perspective, but there are 23 studies on jumping. There are 28 studies on running and sprinting, 22 on golf. There are eight on soccer, six on tennis, six on throw. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna disagree strongly uh, that from the vast majority of the literature that it doesn't represent. These studies are done in oftentimes ecologically representative environments, i.e. a golf course. Individuals are given cues, especially if it's within subject, internal, external control, they're randomized. I love that because that's what coaches do. We try different cues out and see which ones work. So I think we need to be careful to brand the current external focus or attentional focus literature as not ecologically valid. Maybe for certain movements, certain contexts, most certainly, Jed, I would agree. But on the whole, from a movement perspective, 
I, I strongly disagree, and I want to be cautious of putting that narrative out there because I think there's far more ecological validity in this space than in many others in strength conditioning. So yeah, I, I was referring to to the clinical situation, uh, yeah. Nick. So in ACL rehab, uh, of course, we, yeah, that, that's you bring yeah, up a good again, point. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. The broader, but we take the whole literature and good principles yeah, yeah. need to scale across context, population, skill level, and they do and. I, you hear the passion because I've spent over 15 years now educating people on this. We do not need to qualify internal language for people anymore. We need to show them where it goes in a temporal fashion. We need to show the role of internal. But for me, we need to be very cautious in suggesting that internal still has a dominant place in the focus while we move. I've yet to see evidence that will convince me otherwise. Uh, I have a question from uh, the, the listening listeners I wanted to pull in, and I think this, I'm not sure if this is exactly what the, the person is asking, but I think to me it relates to a little bit of the it, one issue that people have brought up with internal external is the stage, right? There's some evidence I've have a little bit of it. There's some, that, you know, if you're really novice, internal is more appropriate. You know, there's also disagreements of that. There's also this one I think is, um, I'll bring it in here. You could see it. I'm wondering what the current perspective is on the relationship between the use of an internal focus in early ACL rehab and the mm. effect of this approach on motor cortex excitability. So the first part of it, I'm kind of reading as, do we do something different right when the person comes into the clinic and barely move versus when they are, you know, maybe like the study I did when they were actually physically cleared by the doctor um, and there was really no residual movement problems. It was just performance. It, it, do we do something different? We do, should we be doing the same thing? Um, and then I, I, I'm not sure about the motor, if anyone has comments about the motor excitability. Does anyone want to jump in on either of those? I think, um, I think to the first point, and I'll, I'll let all the brain experts do motor mm -hmm. cortex, but um, in terms of the the coming into, you know, you just got her coming into, I think, you know, with pain and all that, just from personal experience, you know, you're you're kind of, you're really focusing on your your yeah. knee. You know, that's what, that's what's happening. So it doesn't really make sense to me for PT to then kind of just you know put more sort of internal focus cues on the fact that I'm already thinking about it. Um, so I think an external analogy sort of situation will just help uh, help me. Um, and I think I, again, those studies I think need to be done where you just come in, you just got hurt. What do you do? Um, you know, to, to your point, uh, Rob, that your, your paper was swat on, um, but it did show after a certain amount of time. So the issue is now, you know, what happens right when I come in for the first time. And I think that's where the education piece needs to be sort of really honed in on is I'm a physical therapy student. Okay. I'm, I'm probably uh, being told that, you know, a person comes in with uh, an ACL injury, the first thing I do is, I might be wrong, but more so extension of the knee, right? But, you know, there's all, that's that you're taught to do that, but then there's different ways to do that. There's, yeah. there's uh, how yeah. the frequency effects, you know, how many times, and I think that's one of the underrepresented parts in the literature is frequency. Uh, I think that's mm -hmm. one thing that we don't really talk about because uh, as coaches and clinicians, you know, let's be honest, we like to talk a lot. Uh, so like how does that actually affect the, the person? Um, and then the, the this aspect of coming into uh, rehab with an injury, uh, you know, what am I focusing on and then how am I focusing on it? I think those two have to be delineated uh, as clinicians, uh, which I think, uh, you know, with, with Nick's book, it's gonna get there, but it is, in literature wise, there needs to be a lot more for that. Um, yeah. so. That's yeah. Just, yeah. If I can add, uh, Arjuf, um, there is a, a recent study that came out. Um, I, I forgot the name. I can look it up later, uh, share with you. But um, what they did, they randomized uh, acute patients after an ACL reconstruction, one in the standard group with an internal focus, uh, practicing quad sets. And the second group used an exercise game in which they had to follow a certain sequence of airplanes and they could score points. And basically, they did the same activity, which was to uh, activate your quad. They measured uh, the quad strength before the intervention, and they measured it after the intervention. Both groups had exactly the same training dosage, so a very good point. 
But what they found was that the group that did the access gaming, and if you want to call this an external focus, mm -hmm. leave it open, but they mm -hmm. had uh, significantly, and not only significantly, but also clinically relevant higher quad strength after the intervention compared to the control group. And I think what it does, going also to some psychological uh, factors, which I'm not an expert in, but you are not focusing on your knee, you're doing yeah. an activity. Yeah. And I think that's a very strong uh, tool that we have in our hands with the modern technology. And that, and that speaks to the whole, you know, dynamical systems perspective, right? If we were to kind of talk about, you know, going from the sort of modal learning theories, you know, really representative design, you know, making something more game-like or making something, yeah. you know, like we can, that's another podcast for another day, but like that's, you know, uh, it's right alongside that, which also needs to be uh, considered. So. Mm -hmm. uh, what about uh, Anna or Jed or Nick? Do you have, what about do you have any thoughts about this issue of kind of stage? You know, how do you transition uh, from early injury to late? You know, immediately after injury to later recovery? You know, or or early in skill development? Any any thoughts or experiences with that? Well, I um, I only wanted to add to to Harjee of what I uh, always tell my students when I when I teach is that um, like. Um, Dusty Grooms has uh, has found that um, in in those patients, there's already increased activity in in those those brain areas, um, motor planning, sensory mm -hmm. processing, or visual motor control. So, like Harjeev saying, patient is coming in already focusing at the knee. So, why would you, with an internal focus, even more focus at the knee? So, and and then even activate those areas probably even more. Um, so, it would be really nice to to see some studies. Um, uh, <laughs> maybe even brain studies, but to, to see what that does. Um, yeah. You know, just a quick point. Um, I think one of also the uh, misconceptions of internal and external is that if I'm encouraging someone to, you know, flex their hip, for example, I can still tell them to point their knee towards the wall because I'm not really telling them to concentrate on the hip per se, you know? Um, so I think there's certain things, especially in rehab, that we can kind of uh, look at, um, and you know, that was one of the main questions we brought up in class was, you know, if I'm encouraging hip flexion, and I, I don't tell them to concentrate on their hip, but another part of the body, is that the same thing? I and mean, that's another good question. Uh, I think, you know, if I tell them to point their knee to the wall and I encourage hip flexion, I still still consider it an external focus. So, mm -hmm. yeah. still needs to be mm -hmm. doing. I, I think this with this issue of stage, and maybe you could speak more to this, Nick, as and, and Jed as well. The one of the things we could take into account, right? External versus external is only one dimension, like as yeah. you say, right? The, another big one is distance of the cue. You know, maybe you start really close to the body when something's immediately recovered, and then you move it out as they get, you know, and there's direction of the cue. So there's other things you can play with and change. It's not a binary choice, right? Um, there's only one or the other. You can you can systematically change the use of external cues at, across stages of learning or across stages of recovery. So, um, yeah, Jed or, just, yeah, yeah Nick? just a few, a few, a few yeah. small, few small points. Um, mm -hmm. Number one, uh, I think we have, we have to go back to the literature and examine where where internal language is a benefit and we know that when we use internal language that a couple things happen one there appears to be greater co-contraction around the joint so if you were doing quad sets and you wanted local co-contraction at that area and that was the logic behind one could argue that an internal cue for activate the quad is better uh, at the same time we know that there's greater emg Typically, now usually it comes in the form of arguably less efficiency, but still, if you want a greater EMG and greater co-contraction, uh, it seems that an internal cue, if it was a very isolated activity, might be beneficial. But the points that I don't need to remake, everyone's already made quite nicely, is there's already such a focus on that area. It's decoupling them from the I, injury. Yeah. And I most notably know that, as, as everyone else does, that the, the, the knee or the hamstring person, even weeks, months after they're fully rehab, is grabbing the knee, grabbing the hamstring. So from a, psycho a psychological perspective, like Ali, I'm not an expert in psychology, the, the decoupling of that from the injury plus the benefit of the external focus, and then obviously everything we know around choking under pressure and how that might relate to this, I think that the evidence is clear that we, from a movement perspective, should be shifting them to an external focus as soon as possible. 
Uh, the other the other thing is it's been brought up by everyone. I agree. The the binary discussion of internal and external is not is not good enough at all. And Harjeev brings up a great point. I I'll reference joints in relation to an external marker, a wall, the ground, all the time. And my lived experience is that it operates more like an external focus than let's say extending the, the hip. And so the way I outline it is narrow internal joint or muscle, broad internal limb movement, hybrid, singular point on body to environment, close external and far external. Uh, I do believe and I hope that the book in part taking that as let's say a zoomed in view of the continuum will allow richness in looking at the kind of internal or the kind of external. Cause I don't believe all internal cues are created equal. Just like I don't believe all external cues are created equal. Mm -hmm. Yep. Jed, do you, you want to add in? The um, I'm not sure if anyone actually answered the end of Dave's question. Yeah. Regarding you, uh, motor cortex yeah. excitability. Um, this is yeah. something that's always question me and I think at least mm -hmm. I far less coaching experience say than Nick but when you tell them this external focus stuff that I am a fan of a lot of the questions I get is well how how does that work or why does that work and you can go into the EMG but remember any sort of muscular activity is still driven from say a motor cortex sending an action potential to the spinal cord people want to know how this works and how do these co-contractions evolve and unfortunately for attentional focus that's we don't know a lot right now um, at least to David's no. specific point um, we know They've done it with finger abduction, so by using transcranial magnetic stimulation, um, which generally, basically it applies a magnetic stimulation to your motor cortex um, and looks at how the spinal cord innervates on a muscle um, during, say, an isometric contraction. But typically these have, done, these have been done with finger abduction, and we can see this elevated intracortical or um, heightened uh, motor cortex excitability um, when participants adopt an internal focus. So we can basically shift this um, when people adopt an external focus. Um, the challenge with a lot of that and kind of to Dave's question um, with respect to any um, say knee um, function or um, as we know a lot of TMS studies have shown this altered uh, corticomotor ex excitability following ACL reconstruction. We don't necessarily know this as well with respect to attentional focus uh, mainly because say even the motor cortex itself has say what are called knee motor regions versus finger motor regions. It's, it's not quite as nuanced as just stimulating the entire motor cortex. Um, but my assumption would be it would work very similar. Um, the researcher's name is Kuhn, who's done this work with TMS. Um, but I mean, um, new approaches. I know Ali and I have been using some EEG and some other techniques. Can't necessarily get at uh, motor cortex excitability, but we can start getting at the surrounding regions that ultimately drive the motor cortex and ultimately um, push out that muscular response. Mm -hmm. wow, that's really interesting. Yeah, I didn't. I don't know of any work. Has there been work done that's manipulated focus of attention? Yeah, I can send, and looked at that. I it, can say motor. Them yeah, yeah. There's yeah. one in scientific reports. It's a finger abduction. So oh, okay. the, the yeah. muscle um, co-contraction um, mm. is in response to trans, uh, magnetic stimulation. Um, with respect to brain, some have done uh, F nears, but that only gets at the um, blood response and basically the prefrontal and some parietal regions. Um, but yeah. from say, a whole brain, there's far less on that um, mm. to actually know what's um, causing these changes or at least contributing to the motor changes we see. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a challenge. one of the challenges of understanding this area. And, and mm -hmm. to your point, Nick, and everyone, that they're not all created equal. Is there, Well, I think one of the reasons external cues are so effective is they have so many different possible <laughs> benefits, right? They, they, the excitability, the not you know, interrupting your coordination, like taking mm -hmm. one, um, the directing to useful information. One, one of the, I've been trying to tease apart in a recent is they, some types of internal external cues encourage uh, self-organization exploration, mm -hmm. right? They, mm -hmm. if you use it in the right way, you're not telling the person, this is the technique you're letting them explore. I know Gabby's talked about that idea. Yeah, that's as well, cool. Too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and maybe I can give an example, and mm. you can argue whether it's an external focus or not, but mm. what we use for our patients after uh, an ACL reconstruction uh, for the sa same exercise that Dave was uh, asking about, we, uh, we use an EMG device, uh, mm. and it's uh, presented as a tablet in front of the patient, and we measure the healthy side and, uh, and, uh, and then the injured mm. side, and you see the graph for the hamstrings and the quads. And then I can see that typically for the injured side, and then there is an equal contraction. So like what Nick was saying, there's a co-contraction, uh, hamstrings and quads, equal activity. So what I can do with this software, I can 
lower one bar for the hamstrings and I can increase the bar as a goal for the quad activity. And all I tell them, this is your goal. How they do it, I leave it totally open to them. Yep. And it's like, I think what, what Harchi was also saying is going more towards the dynamic systems. I'm not telling them how to do it, but they figure it out themselves. And typically, uh, when, we, when we look at, uh, compared to standard techniques, when I tell them, uh, extend your knee, whatever, they, 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 they don't grasp it. And this is a concept that can easily grasp. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I'd love, you know, in, in, in preparing to, to write the, the book, I, I got into your, your, let's say, historical, but then more of our more recent motor control. And I'd love every, other individuals' thoughts on this. If we go into kind of this whole idea of, of in, internal models and these, you know, the, these efferents copies from a, an actual motor control perspective, you know, I like to use the following example and I do in the book, and that is if you are moving house and you walk up to a box and that box says pots and pans, your internal model of picking up a box of pots and pans is going to be something very heavy. And mm. so we, we prepare to pick up that box. But yeah. if, you know, if your partner, for whatever reason, packed that with pillowcases, <laughs> All of a sudden, you go to pick up that box and you shoot up. And how many times in physical therapy has someone come in with a blown out back picking up the lightest thing possible? And so I use that example to, to suggest the following. And that is, I think we have pretty good evidence on the motor control side that we organize our movement in terms of these intended outcomes, in terms of these goals. Yeah. And so ultimately for me, if I tell you to squeeze your glute or extend your hip, yet you're performing a vertical jump. I'm actually get, I'm giving competing goals. And that's why the attentional system, I believe, and I think there's evidence on reaction time and otherwise to show, is ultimately being confused. And so yes. even if, let's, if you scrap the whole attentional focus literature, you go right on back to motor control. I believe the evidence for an external focus in a healthy nervous system exists right there. I mean, when, when, when kids learn, um, they learn that way, and um, for some reason we started. Uh, or we, we changing it at some point, and yeah. went to teach yeah. with an internal focus. But uh, the natural way of learning is um, is is actually different. <laughs> and I think you bring I, up a good I, point. That, yeah, that's where, that's where you need, uh, as Jed mentioned, more than nonlinear uh, sort of analyses need to be done because sometimes you just can't, uh, you know, see it or, or analyze it. And I think, you know. I think uh, this notion of variability, although you know it's been in motor control for so long, um, it needs to be more so uh, applied to the attentional focus literature now. Um, there's only been sort of, I think, quite a, just just a you know a handful of papers, but um, there should be more with that. I was just on a call actually this right before this um, on motor control and this idea of like redundancy and abundancy and equivalence and adaptation and essentially you know we are like nick mentioned to uh we are sort of wired to just fo to concentrate on that intended outcome um the problem is is us as coaches and, and clinicians is uh well, we yeah, take that we strip that away from you and we're like yep you know um so uh and and sometimes you know we if we look at more of the um dynamical systems and self-organization realm of things you know, are we uh, are we making these compensatory movements um, to aid in that certain goal, or are we making them for some something else? Um, and so, I think I think just more needs to be done in motor control, uh, for instance, in terms of attentional focus. Um, and I think that will give us really good insight into that initial question on moving from you know initial phases of rehab all the way to to the end. Um, so while there's been 25 years of research, there's just so many more questions. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Exciting. And I'm super glad that, that that Dr. Wolf started the optimal theory because that's essentially why what brought me all the way here was, you know, there's there's not just attention. And I think that's sort of what needs to be uh, really focused on now. Um, and and uh, we can yeah. do <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm constantly fighting, I don't want to call it a battle, but sometimes it feels like it, uh, certainly in the ACL, ACL field, it's like uh, valgus is somewhat of the, of the thing that needs to be avoided at all times. And, and, and my point is, 
don't uh, treat or don't target valgus, but target what leads to valgus. That's that's a different approach, because uh, even a healthy athlete needs to have uh, some knee abduction when pivoting uh, and making 180 degree uh, turn. It's about how you control those loads, and um, this is where perhaps attentional focus or EF uh, instructions may be helpful if you have more attentional resources available because the movements are coordinated based on the constraint action hypothesis that might help you as an athlete from a preventative standpoint to perceive what's going around the field and plan your actions accordingly and don't use all the resources needed for your movements. And that's, if we believe the literature, that's what 90% of the therapists do by inducing an, an inch on the focus of attention. So, but this is, uh, not proven yet so this is just a, an, an observation from my side yeah yeah great great points there and yeah my view a lot you know from my I have a more ecological view of things uh motor learning is um i don't like internal cues a lot of them because they're overly prescriptive right you can't refer to the body almost you're telling the person how to move you're encouraging low variability and almost always internal yeah. cues go in hand in hand with corrective feedback right? Exactly. You didn't exactly. do this yeah. exactly the yeah. way I want. Yeah. And we talked about coaches <laughs> talking too much. Well, that's yeah. one of the things they do too much, too much yeah. corrective feedback. I'd much rather you give external thing, let the person figure it out. Like you're saying, do however you want, yeah. <laughs> be yeah. variable, try different things. Um, yeah, that's and, also, and, yeah. 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 You know, I but, take, I take the, I take a lot of educational psychology classes um, because I like this aspect of teaching uh, and, and how we teach. And I think one of the main takeaways is, these words like shouldn't, um, these words like you must, it's just, we don't think about it, but they are so detrimental um, to how we how we end up performing. I mean, yeah, more literature has to be done to show the evidence, but um, just from like, you know, just teaching students and, and school teaching wise, that's the one thing they tell you is to avoid this sort of, um, the, these types of words that um, sort of, um, sort of um, I guess, represent like power and, and stuff like that, which you don't want. So it's, yeah. Yeah, it's just a whole nother ball game, but it's interesting. And sure. We also did uh, some studies kind of confirming that most people, maybe it's like 30, 70 percent or something like that, but most people prefer to get feedback when they're doing well to, to kind yeah. of confirm, especially athletes, they, they know about how they move. Uh, so it's, I mean, we, we like, we, re we really want to help them and to talk much and, and, oh, when it doesn't go well, you know, we want to help them, but try to hold back a little bit and try to wait mm -hmm. and, and give them some positive feedback when it did go well. And uh, then they can continue with that performance. Uh, yeah, it has so many, many aspects. That, that's what, what also my point was at the beginning, that, that just the external focus is, is not the golden recipe for all. It, it should be seen in, in, in a context and in, in a context in a learning environment, yeah. working with athletes who are working with patients, consists also about aspects like self-control, uh, autonomy, uh, motivation, uh, self-efficacy, and all other aspects that play a role in, in learning. So not just the instruction itself is the magic ball here. Mm -hmm. oh. and, and see, well, this is why this is so important is because all of these little ingredients that we combine together to cook the meal that is learning movement are so underrepresented, which is why it's such an honor to be talking with all of you, because it is our job to, to venture forward and share this in practical ways uh, with the world. Yeah. 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 So it looks like we're, we've gone around the hour a bit, and I know we could probably talk about this all day, but I want to be conscious of people's time. So maybe, maybe I want to go around the room and just any last thoughts you have, you know, what we need to do to advance the, the clinical side of things, the research side of things, any, anything you, you, you pops in your head as a last thought. Uh, Jed, you want to, I'll let oh, you go what? first this time. <laughs> so people don't take them all. Um, no, I think everything, especially Ali and Nick ended this are great. Um, working at finding ways, it's our duty to ultimately transfer this information to the real world per se, and whether that some of us think that might require a little more um, different research scenarios that could better represent, say, the real world. I know that's a hard term to ever uh, represent, um, but I think any way we can um, better understand how what we do in the lab um, affects those um, either undergoing rehabilitation or in a sporting setting um, is highly influential. Mm -hmm. Nick, do you have any? 
you know, you kind of did I, I one think, before. I, <laughs> yeah, I, I said that. I think what you're doing now, Rob, I mean, notably, Rob, what you are doing and what we're all trying to mm -hmm. do is just more of that. Yeah. Anyway, Anna, do you have any? I, I agree. I think it's good to uh, bring research re uh, results to, to the field, to those who are working with uh, athletes on a, on a daily basis. And um, let them figure it out. Don't try to be smarter with than the, the body or brain of the athlete with too many explicit mm -hmm. instructions. Let the body figure it out. Yeah. Here, here. Beautiful. Yeah. Harjeev? Uh, well, considering I'm a student, I have so many um, <laughs> uh, things that we can do. But I'll just I'll just say a couple. I think uh, the brain is definitely something we need to we need to focus on, um, because by understanding what's happening in the brain, we can then um, sort of start um, understanding how to better develop practice conditions. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing is this idea of frequency and distance need to be very much uh, uh, more uh, analyzed. And uh, I think at the end of the day, it is as re as, as as researchers, um, it's 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 our fault that we're you know that we're we're getting all these arguments back. Um, I think we need to just do a better job in terms of actually making this material. Um, I guess more applicable um, and um, getting the information out there. So again, Nick's book, this podcast, um, the Motor Learning Institute. Like this, is, these are ways that we're doing it, uh, which uh, I think uh, in the next couple of years we'll definitely see a shift. Um, and and you know, I think my goal now is to bring this to ESPN. So it's gonna. <laughs> <laughs> Jed laid down there. Jed, the, Jed the, laid down the, the <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Ali, do you have a? Yeah, uh, it's always the most difficult to say some, something useful at the end, but um, <laughs> uh, I, I would say like, in, uh, for sure, sharing the information that we, yeah. that we know from, from research, but we must not forget the end user, whether it's the athlete, the coach, or the, or the patient, and perhaps a, a qualitative research approach would also help in this respect. What do they think of it? What works for them? What doesn't work for them? And that's, I think, highly valuable information that we need to take back as researchers and uh, design better approaches if there's something that doesn't work that for, for their clinical setting. Mm -hmm. So I think then we have a good uh, collaboration between the two fields. Yeah, that good would addition. Be awesome. Yeah, you know? yeah, and I, I guess the last thing I would say, you know, bringing it back full circle to this paper, you know, as a researcher. Um, looking at these kind of outcomes like sway and, you know, may, maybe angles when someone's jumping and recovering for injury, injury, I'd really like to see an emphasis on, we talked about this, the functionality of these mm. movements, right? Mm. Not all sway is you no know, bad, right? Um, looking no. at something like an uncontrolled manifold analysis, something where you look at actually, the, is this useful variability? Yeah. Just trying yeah. to get rid of it at all is yeah. in the variability and all is one of my main messages. That I, no, that's bad, right? Bad thing to do. So a whole new podcast. Anyway. <laughs> <on variability. laughs> but anyways, um, so thank you very much, everybody. Um, that was really great, and uh, we'll everyone listening. We'll see you next time. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. 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 Th